Okay, this should be a new episode of By the Numbers, League of Legends edition. And I'm, well, I don't know what way to do this around because it's not so many insights. So we'll just say I'm Thorin, blah, 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 usual co host. And uh, actually, no, I normally do the Alpha Draft commercial first. Then I say, okay, as with all the shows, they're all sponsored by Alpha Draft. And there's a twist this time. It's not just about Alpha Draft and then something abstract that has nothing to do with Alpha Draft, but secretly tricks you into thinking about Alpha Draft and then even outrages you because you go, that doesn't even have anything to do with Alpha Draft. And you realize in your own mind, you've said Alpha Draft seven times. And essentially, <laughs> I've not only been paid, but the Illuminati contacts me and says, how do you do it? Like, how do you control the minds of people? I mean, we've been trying to do it for years and the best we can do is sort of get like Lady Gaga into like a Super Bowl halftime thing or something. So how, how are you doing it? And I say... You'll never find out my secrets unless you pay me a lot of money and I'll just tell you them all basically. So there's a twist to the Alpha Draft Chronicles, as they've become known, which is that we actually have our own promotion code. And if you go to Alpha Draft and you use the code BTN, as in by the numbers, then, well, can stand for anything actually. It's not even if you think it stands for banana toffee nuts, you still get the code. So even if you're a moron, as long as you remember those three numbers, letters, just type them in, and you get uh, it's a 100% pending bonus up to $300. So, the key thing to understand there is you don't get $300 right now if you put it in. <laughs> but if you put in $300 and you keep playing, one day you will get $300, exactly 100% upgrade of yours. A bit like even if Monty tries to put together a good team. He won't win immediately. He won't get wins immediately. Right? But if he keeps changing players, eventually his wins will go up by 100%. Like it started with one. It took a while, but, you know, he eventually unlocked some of that, kept changing players. And one day, maybe, could be like up to five wins. Could, listen, sky's the limit, Monty. I, just, I don't want to limit your dreams. So our co-host is Monty Cristo, as usual. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm finished with the off draft. Portion of the uh, show great. So, okay. in many ways, that's like the only part of the show we have to actually nail. Like the rest of it, we can say almost anything we want. Like they, they, oh, they you, get to, you get in trouble when you start saying things that you want to say, Duncan. The things I want to say. <laughs> it's the things that you want to say in life that get you in trouble. It's kind of a metaphor, Monty. It's kind of a. It's not really a metaphor at all. Actually, I'm just very tired. It's just like a poignant statement. Really, it's not a metaphor in any way. It's just a, an observation on life in many ways. It is indeed. Wow. Do you ever find in your line of work that the things that you want to say are what get you in trouble? Uh, yes, constantly. You know that. Like that time you <laughs> wanted to really let the world know that uh, Shy stole a Baron with some <laughs> <thing. laughs> If you hadn't wanted to do so much, right? I take, I, that's the thing I have to say. I noticed that the joke always is that you did it. I'll just correct everyone for stuff. It was actually Doa that said that. Monty actually just made the fatal mistake floor of backing him up. So yes. unfortunately, <laughs> no one, there's no such thing as like Doa's thing. Oh, remember the time Doa said something? Oh, right, actually, he's not actually the cult player. He just <laughs> says stuff. Okay. It's okay for him to say stuff wrong. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it is my job to uh, correct any mistakes that exist, uh, which I failed to do. So I would still count it as my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do notice that it's okay to th say things wrong if you're a not if you're a riot caster, though. Like, I mean, I watched this segment the other week where Riv was telling me that like Bang is like a top three LCS Sadie carries. I was like, yep, okay, yep, don't don't <laughs> jump in there, anyone. Freak tried to save him. So here's, the, here's the key thing: Freak tried to save him by going, yeah, yeah, we're fine if we're talking internationally. Yeah, yeah, Bang's got to be right up there. Like, but but we're not, though, are we? Freak? So, <laughs> so I, you tried, but that didn't work actually. There, so you know, just saying. So, okay, we'll make this show a little bit more Summoning Insight style since obviously we don't have an episode this week because unfortunately I have to be away all week so we couldn't get one in. But we have got, I mean, we won't reveal the guest because I don't, I don't ever like to do that style where you like hype something up in advance because you never know when like schedules you will that, change. Or, you do that all the time. You literally make Facebook like posts announcing our guests on SI all the fucking time. Oh, I, well, technically though, Monty, I do it when the, the episode is in the can though. See, so it, nothing can stop it at that point in time. Only my death That's can true. stop it. And as far as I'm concerned, Monty, when I die, the universe dies. Like <laughs> as soon as my light goes off the world, I don't believe any of you exist. This is all a game in either a virtual reality simulation designed by aliens, a virtual reality simulation designed by God, some sort of a dream of a butterfly in uh, 
a butterfly inside some sort of a bobble because it needed to live, but inside like a, a jar somewhere. And the scientists think dreaming that it is an alpha draft squirrel lord shill doing a talk show in League of Legends. Very abstract dream for a butterfly to have, but you don't know what butterflies dream, what dreams a butterfly does in fact have. None of us know. So you can't dispute that. And See, that, that ends the butterfly you, speculation segment of the show. I, I know you're green enough, though, that wouldn't you actually right. want, wouldn't you actually desire that uh, somebody go through all your unreleased material and then release it just as a testament to your career and what you were working on as you died? It's very important to the biographical record of yourself. Uh, yes and no, because there's one, th actually one thing that does tilt me is you sometimes find stories where, someone who was like a really great person in history like died when they were working on something like, oh please destroy this but actually i forget off the top of my head but there's some instances where like it actually ended up being like an incredible piece of art you know and the person like maybe they didn't think it was good enough yet and they wanted it to be destroyed like, but actually like someone John, John kennedy tool with the confederacy of dunces there's one so but uh, but on the other hand though I think of some people where some of the work that they were doing was actually shit and then someone just released it anyway. So that's the, see, that's the downside, Monty. I don't want you thinking, right, well, you know, I had to take my locks when I was working with Thorin. So now, now, I'm, now he can no longer hurt me. I can only benefit from the fact that he was in some way associated with me. And you trying to sort of like palm off my old shit, like half finished articles about, why TSM's morally wrong or something, you know, and then just being like, yeah, 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 oh no, he told me actually that this was his magnum opus and he was working on it until his, or even worse, just doing like, uh, doing like what Frank Herbert's son did, where what Frank Herbert's son did, okay, is Frank Herbert wrote the first six Dune books, but what a lot of people don't know is there was going to be seven, okay, and the seventh one would be the end of the series and it would be amazing and it would encapsulate everything that the series had been about. And so what his son said was, this is, this is like, this is some straight like, Joseph, whatever his name was, what was the guy from uh, Joseph Smith level, like not even vaguely plausible story that I can't believe anyone, but it's okay. So, okay, the Frank Herbert's son actually said like, oh yeah, by the way, guys, uh, like my dad actually totally left notes for June 7. Like, don't worry, like it isn't like, it, you know, he didn't like just die and not write it. Like he totally left notes. But first of all, I'm going to write about 20 books that aren't Dune 7. Just, you know, like get my writing going, you know, like learn how to write. But don't worry, don't worry. Like, all the notes are definitely there. And then after you'd written like all these other books to do with every other aspect of the Dune universe, he's finally like, you know what, guys? I know you've been waiting a long time. Dune 7. Are you ready? Dune 7. We're going to complete the series totally from his notes. Like I haven't made any of this shit up. It's not like I've delayed and stalled for years and years while I've been cracking my brain, trying to think of some shit to make up that might sound like Dune 7. But you know what? Here we go. This is totally what was in his notes. Made a book, right, that essentially had nothing to do with the rest of the series. Like, he tried his hardest, but it just looked like someone who was a shit writer who wasn't Frank Herbert. Like, tried to get some ideas and did and did just, like, everything about it was wrong. Like, philosophically, I was like, it's in some ways the antithesis of the point of the other books. And the key part of it all is, my theory is, that actually there were notes on June 7. It said this write Dune 7, and then I believe he died. And so I think his son really did just spend all that time stalling. And then finally came up with like that very paltry thing. So my problem there is, you might also do that. You might be like, yeah, he was also working on this. I'm like, no, I, I'm the one to think of it. Like it. Because, no. because you know me, and like, I am the one who would actually go out and try and ruin the legacy of my no, close friends. No, here's the key thing. It, the no, key thing no. is, <laughs> I think this is telling so us articles. more about you and what you would do to me yeah. as opposed to what I would do to you. That's it. Is it the key <laughs> thing about it is, you could take any art. And my point is, you could take any article that I didn't write. Like, say, I just have a notepad thing that's talking about like riot and competitive integrity. And then you could do the same thing. Like, I took his notes and I've just like published them now. But then really, it'd have all these like obviously idiosyncratic things to you within there, but you'd put them through the mask. And if anything, you'd probably enjoy it more because you'd you'd have a freedom about how you could talk because technically you'd be writing it under my persona and you'd be going buck wild. You'd be putting in all sorts of all sorts of references to race theory and all sorts of stuff. So I, I am worried, if anything, Monty, that it would corrupt you. Like having that vehicle through which to speak might make you worse than you are right now. Now, the limitations of your own persona, in many ways, that is the only the only cage that keeps you under control. So if you were given my powers, Monty, my ability to just say whatever I want, I don't, I fear for the world. So it's not just you being corrupted. I fear for what would happen to the world at large. You know? 
So, okay. Oh, by the way, you know what? Let's have a look. We've got obviously we've got LCK this week. So let's see. I noticed none of the contests. Okay, so actually there's a load of swag jar contests. So there's a Monte Cristo hype train that's EU LCS. There's a swag jar for both. There's a Monte Cristo hype train that's NLCS. There's one for each. And then there's a Thorin swag jar for EU LCS, NLCS, and LCK. Again, like it is funny, but I don't really understand why the Thorin swag jar exists for LCK, but there's not a Monte Cristo's <laughs> hype train for LCK. Not least since I know the least about LCK. So that's the part that doesn't really make sense. But I guess in a way, it makes more sense that you do the swag jar you one know on the one where you least about that. the most competitive region. What is wrong with you? Well, in terms of swag jar, because you have to realize the concept of swag jar, remember, is to pick the players who are probably yeah. going to lose. But you pick. So as a result, the matches I watch in LCK are the good matches. I don't watch when <laughs> when true. Samsung plays Svenu, you know. But you know what? If we're going to speak about swag, Monty, if we're going to speak about calling stuff before it happens, if we're going to talk about LCK, you're probably thinking, oh, it's a lot of great topics. You know, Samsung's been had that win over Rocks, Jeanette's progressing. No, 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 no. Again, I'm not going to actually use this segment of the show to talk about some like high-level analysis. I want to just use this on the most low-level, petty degree to just point out, Monty, <laughs> I am the only person who said this. Are you ready? Do you remember a few weeks ago? It was maybe like four or five weeks ago. It was before we did that 1v1. I told you, you were like, oh, it's Samsung so good. And I was like, they're all right. You were like, what are you talking about? They're like top four. Top and I was like, they're not even as good as Jyn Air. You remember this, Monty? I did call that Jyn Air was better than Samsung. Now, I'll give you this. Samsung did beat Rocks. That's true. They, that was and they beat Jyn Yeah, you know what else, though? <laughs> They're not as good as Jyn Air. Jyn Air is the top two team in Korea. Hey, Jyn Air just lost to SK Telecom. Yeah, that happens. Jyn Air still isn't, isn't godlike. But they, think, but they, they are good. They are good. I, th I think that the top seven teams in Korea are so close that it's really hard to tell who's going to be able to make the, the playoffs. But the thing is, the difference is, though, it doesn't make any sense that Jyn is good. They literally did lose their two best players. I mean, they lost uh, Coco. They lost... Uh, well, not Coco. They lost GBM. They lost Chaser. These yeah, were their two best players. Also, Trace got super good somehow. And and the weirdest one to me, I think, is Kuzan. Because we've seen Kuzan. It's not like he never played. He just wasn't vaguely as good as this. In fact, now he became like... Like he basically even just looks like GBM when you watch him play now. He's he's pretty good, right? Yeah, he is doing pretty well for himself overall. I think I think Kuzan is is an interesting case for sure. Okay, so let me have a look here. I I got I've got a question for you. Okay, so now everyone and their mother is going to hype Samsung, right? Oh, Samsung, it's so good. Oh, yeah, so good. I notice everyone, this is why, what I love, right, is when you see examples that, like, aren't just, like, slightly borderline, like, oh, I guess you could have that opinion. When it's, like, so egregious as to whether someone's been watching the league or whether they haven't and they're pretending they're watching the league. So here's how you know if someone's been watching LCK, okay. They would watch the Rocks Samsung game and go, wow, what an incredible series from Ambition, comma, hasn't really been doing that that much this season. Anyone who didn't watch LCK would go, wow, I always knew Ambition was this god like You know why I don't think that, Monty? Because I watched the series they played before that. Do you remember the series they played before they played Rocks? <laughs> who was it they played against? They had a series where uh, it was KT. the opposite. Like, Samsung was... Uh, what's his name? Ambition was a fucking dumpster in that one. Yes. <laughs> That's the whole thing. The whole thing about the, the Rock series that was crazy was he not only or, was his uh, level CJ, way higher. CJ, that was CJ like, was yeah, exactly. It was CJ. It was his whole team. What was crazy about the Samsung Rock series is that not only was his level higher, but it was like through the whole series it was higher. I mean, he had like two yeah. games that were phenomenal. What did you think of this series? Yeah, I, I think that he played really well. Uh, he had some problems in game number one, and he helped feed the LeBlanc, which really helped Kuro get rolling. But I think in the the previous two series, so the, they played against CJ, lost 0-2 to CJ. Then they before that, they played against KT, lost 0-2 to KT. I think he was really underwhelming in both of these series. So he's been a bit inconsistent. But he did play really well in the last two games against the Rocks Tigers, it's true. He was very good, especially his Kindred game was really good. So, okay, we have... Uh... Let me see. I, we'll just do it. We'll tie in the, the fixtures to the topics we're talking about. So since we're talking about Samsung at the moment, in like two days or whatever it is, 
uh, one day, 10 hours, apparently. Samsung plays Africa Freaks. Now, is Samsung so improved that it will be a 2-0? Uh, I mean, yeah, Africa Freaks should, have had I, some weird one-offs where they've taken them out from people. Oh, they've taken them game from rather. Rocks. They've taken games from SKT. Like, it's definitely not all so like, It's up, actually surprising how but... many times they've taken games, right? Samsung did 2-0 them last time they played, and I think Samsung definitely has an opportunity to continue with that particular, you know, in, that that particular series. Samsung versus Africa, I would say that goes pretty heavily in favor of Samsung. Um, I don't really see the freaks winning that. As far as Samsung goes, Crown is definitely the player that you want to pick for fantasy. But none of the Samsung players are actually that high when it comes to fantasy points. So okay. you, could, you could take Samsung or, or uh, Crown or Core JJ does, if Core even plays. Otherwise, Stitch is not as high as, as Core is when it comes to... Well, Crown uh, is, oh, actual is actually uh, only fifth for mid laners in terms of price. So if you're saying Samsung is yeah, likely to win... Deal. It, that's not not a terrible pickup. Are there any Africa Freaks players you would take? Uh, definitely Song Yoon, if you think there's going to be an upset, because he's the one who usually carries them with the, the big KDAs. If Ambition can have the same kind of game he had previously, as in the last two games, uh, then there's the possibility that he gets a lot of points, too, because he did obviously Probably very, very well. Third highest yeah, jungler. Yeah, I think Crown is actually a really good value here i think it's a, he's a really good value okay and since we talked about jenner okay they've already played the first game this week because they played skt as you said and they lost to them but at the end of the week they will play cj and cj obviously has been is the here's the weird thing cj got so much flack for how shit they were early in the season but it seems like they've gotten stronger actually kind of like quietly though because they haven't well, had like they, monster they, big had, they weren't actually shit the thing about it is that when they came out we expected them to be much worse but they spent the first round robin actually going four and five overall so they were slightly below 50 percent, and they really overperformed considering that they had sky and bubbling and it's worth noting that cj has not yet lost a series playing with bdd so this is How a many team he played, that, though, like two or something, right? What? How many has he played, three. though, like two or something, right? Three? Three, but okay. he, they beat Samsung already. Obviously, their their biggest tests are, are on the horizon, and playing Longju or Jin Air is going to be a much harder time this week. But that said, from, fa from a fantasy perspective, you really want Kramer or Ghost, because Kramer is actually the highest uh, point total player in the league at 33.43 when he is winning. So if you think CJ is going to... I would say take upsets against Longju. That uh, he's going to be the player to do it, and Jinair because he gets all the kills sure. right now. He gets all the money. He gets all the farm. Absolutely everything. So the thing is, not Mad Life then. I mean, Mad Life's been doing very well. It's yeah, Mad Life's been doing well. Right? Yeah, Mad Life's doing well for a support, but you could spending seventy five hundred on as a support may not be the best okay. use of your alpha draft fantasy funds. That's the crazy thing about CJ, though, is that, I mean, obviously the joke with CJ for so long is that even when Madlife was in his, like, godlike part of his career, it's not like the, the wound bot lane was ever super sick. And then, obviously, it definitely wasn't great with space. It was just, like, okay, and then Madlife dropped off. The actual Mad the the overall bot lane for CJ now, now is one of the best in Korea. Thoughts? Uh, yes, definitely one of the best in Korea. Maybe the best in Korea overall. Uh, not only just observationally and because their kill participation is so high but because i mean e even in the from a fantasy sense mad life is the top point player when it comes to supports on average so you so, would put them over the rock spot lane rock spot lane's super good it's just hard to it's hard to tell right now um i i don't know if i'd be so bold as to put them over the rock spot lane yet because rocks has more threats whereas the way that CJ's played this season has been really revolving around ganking for that bottom lane, TPing to the bottom lane, and they group as five more often than they skirmish. So they play a lot differently than the Rocks Tigers do. It does feel like they at least know what side their bread spotted on, to use the English idiom there, which is they just try to get Kramer fed every game, basically, and just get him rolling. Yes. Yes, they do. And they always just group as five in team fight. So he is the main player you want to take in terms of like point getter for CJ. Yeah, Kramer, Kramer and Madlife are, are both very good.
Like, Mad Life's expensive, but he's also the top point support on average. It'll be harder this week, though, like we said. You know, upcoming matches against uh, Jyn Air. And, uh, Since you and said Wong it's Joe. so close, like, who would you actually favor to win that match? Who do you think should win out of CJ and Jyn Air, current form? I don't know, because both of those teams, uh, Jyn Air has the longest average game time, and CJ is a team that you usually have to punish in the early game, because once they start getting into the late game, their team fighting is really good. And that's how they win games. And so if you let if you let Kramer farm a bunch and let him carry the game, CJ is very good at allowing him to do that. So I might actually give a slight edge to the, to CJ in that matchup, surprisingly. Okay. Which would obviously be an upset. So, I mean, in ter- bearing in mind, let me see. Ah, here's the problem, though. So in terms of actual, I'm just looking here, trying to find the... Um, Right on the on the contest, it doesn't actually have Jinair at the moment, as far as I can tell. So they must not have that one since it's the end of end of the week. That'll be a different play day. So I, I can't know how much the players will cost, but I would suspect that when that matchup comes up, they will have the CJ players cheaper in general. It's possible maybe Kramer might be ahead of Pilot. I don't know, but I would assume that's probably good value to get that if it's closer in that sense. Because obviously on the standings, it looks like they're far apart. But if you actually look how many games people have won and lost, like you say, the actual top top level second to sort of sixth it's very close in terms of parity and they beat each other all of it's very close now especially with the addition of bdd it's super hard to tell who is actually going to win a lot of these matches um i also think that jenner they're coming off this loss to skt i think that i think cj is going to be a playoff caliber team when the dust settles they they managed to go like 50 percent before they even had bdd and now they have daydream back if they want to use him too in the jungle what do you actually think about BDD, though? I mean, obviously, you hyped him a bit coming in. No one can live up to the hype of, like, any anytime you call it. This is one of those things. I understand in real sports where they have this, like, lame trope, okay, which is whenever someone says, like, oh, this guy's the next Michael Jordan, there's always this, like, really lame thing that commentators do where they go, no, no, there's only one Michael Jordan. Man. It's like, yeah, obviously, it's not a literal statement, is it, mate? We realize it's not the same person reborn. It's kind of like a point you're making, like, he's in the same mold. So in that sense, obviously when you say the next faker, you don't actually mean he's going to do everything faker did, win two worlds, win four OGNs, et cetera, et cetera. But when you put on anyone the mantle of next faker, the guy better be unreal from the gate, basically. You have to be like a fantastic right out the gate because that's the whole thing of faker. He didn't almost have any warm up time. He came right in and was like instantly just rocking everyone. BDD hasn't been quite that level, right, in the actual games. He had a couple of good games. He had the Azir no, I mean, games. No one's ever good. been on Faker's level in that regard, though. So it may be a bit of an unfair comparison. I think BDD has had some very good games so far, particularly on Azir. But he's had some games on Zed, but that have been obviously there's been a lot of Zed bans against him, and his games on Zed have been like counterpicked by Malphite in the mid lane. So it hasn't been as impressive. But for the most part, he's just been playing utility champions, and that is actually quite interesting uh, because that's not what we expected from him uh considering that he is this flashy assassin player but for the most part he's played like like azir varus oriana and lulu besides one game of zed so it's been mostly azir i'd like to see more from him because a lot of it's been a lot of these control mages so far and his azir has been good and he's actually kind of like single-handedly brought Azir back into the meta because a lot of the other Korean players have started to play Azir now. But it's, uh, you know, he's been, I think he's been very solid, but I just haven't seen enough from him yet. He's definitely way better than Sky was. Okay, so if you had CJ to beat Jin Ed, do you actually think they will beat Long Ju? Because of the thing about Long Ju is, I, don't I mean, know aside from Long the fact Ju, that I don't even running, know what roster they're going to be running. Yeah, I mean, that's the time. obvious thing. It's not just that they changed roster. It's just that even with the, the different rosters, they either look really good or they look super shaky. It doesn't seem like there's that much like variation. Like sometimes they do look like the second or third best team in Korea. And then other times they just lose and you're like, what a fucking underwhelming roster this is. So, do you, so would you tick CJ in as much as the stable in that sense? I think CJ is more stable. I think that obviously they don't have the same kind of ceiling that we've seen from um, from uh, Longju, but well, do, do I even mean that? Like, I think Guntara has been super good, actually. Um, no, I think you're right in as much as like if 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 everything clicks for whichever lineup goes in for Longju, they can be really good. Whereas CJ. 
I don't think they ever blow the doors off. They just they look pretty good well, sometimes. But but... I just I just think that let me put it this way. Let me phrase it this way. I think Longju is more immediately good, as in they have all these veteran star players that can make a more immediate impact when okay. if and when they click. Whereas I think CJ, they've got Untara and BDD uh, it, bubbling. These are a lot of very new players. They're just straight up rookies that are looking better and better. I mean, Untara, I think his growth over the season has been amazing. But I don't think Bubbling's been very good, though. He no, seems like kind of a joke. He's been better since BDD has actually applied mid lane pressure, but I kind of am waiting for them to put in uh, put in um, Daydream again. Okay. So here's the problem is that for the first matchup, that is in the contest that's up at the moment. The only thing is for the CJ matchup, they have Kramer slash Ghost as the most expensive AD carry in the whole league. In fact, he's the most expensive, second most expensive player in the whole competition behind Kuro. So is that still worth it, do you think, for how expensive he is and the fact that, I mean, I mean potentially they could lose to Longju? They could lose to Longju. It could, and here's the thing Longju's been very inconsistent. So I don't know if Longju is going to go for. I don't know if this is going to like if it's going to go to three games. It could be a two zero stomp by CJ, just given how well how Longju's been doing, and depending on which lineup that they use. Um, Longju certainly last week against KT looked really not very good, so I don't know. I like I think Longju and KT are the hardest teams to predict right now because their performances have been like the least consistent. Who do you, if you had to pick between the two, who do you think has been better out of Expression and Flame? Because people are going to think it's just bias, but Expression started the season really well. I think at the moment, Flame is slightly better, which is not to say that he's fantastic, by the way. I think he's better than Expression at the moment. Expression's laning stats have been really good. Like he has one of the highest average leads uh, on the enemy top laner or like the enemy laner at 10 minutes out of all the players. You think he's number two behind Crash, or the jungler from Longju. So he's been doing well right out of the gate, but perhaps they like Flame more from a carry perspective. His ga Flame's gangplank play has been really good. Um, so I don't know. We haven't seen Expression in actually quite some time because even last week they've swapped out uh, like all of the. For the last two matches, we haven't seen expression play. So yeah, I mean, they even didn't stick with the whole line thing. They even put flame in in some of the games where it was the other yep. players. It was Coco, yep. it was Chaser. That's so what that yeah. that does kind of hint towards perhaps if as, as long as they don't have any drastic losses, they're just going to use flame for a while. I, I would suspect from the way it's going. Yeah, I mean, if you're and also just talking about fantasy real quick, if you want Longju, like Coco and Frozen actually have very similar fantasy stats. So it's Coco Frozen and. The Coco slash Frozen, and which you get both players when you draft one, and Captain Jack would be the ones to to pick up. I mean, both of those players, Captain Jack and Coco, or all their counterparts, are third cheapest in their roles, so probably decent value to pick them up. Yeah, and there's For a the possibility because considering we don't know which Longju is going to show up, if Long, I think Longju has a better chance of beating CJ than Jin Air does because they tend to play a more aggressive early game and like hit CJ where they're weak. Whereas Jin Air, like Jin Air, just can't close games, so they give CJ a lot of opportunities to get it back into the late game where CJ is strong. Okay, and then after that, let's see. Okay, so we also have. So you, you mentioned KT, but they are playing Spenu in the first game. So that that is not a very difficult matchup to predict. The question is, do KT players get enough points in dominating wins? Uh, KT players have not been have not been doing so well in fantasy. I mean, last year it was like a ton, a ton, a ton of kills uh four kt players uh, when we talked about this show uh kt this year has been a little bit cleaner but they've also been i would say not quite as good of a team as they were last year score and uh sunday or score and arrow interestingly are the top point players it's really weird but score actually has the highest highest points on the team so if you can grab him uh he is second most expensive but he should be he, he's way up there in terms of junglers with like peanut and blank for points so there's a lot of good value there. And aside from the odd bad game, in general, one of the best junglers in Korea. Yeah, absolutely. What do you actually think of Sunday though? Because it does seem like he has had a down season. Like he's still been good, 
But you had, put it this way, before you could... What was great about last season was you could totally see, depending on who people thought the best top laner was, like what criteria they favoured. So if if they watched Smeb and they thought he was the best, you could see what style of top laner they liked. If they liked Sunbay, like the hard carry style, if they liked Marin, like looking really good, but in a team concept, it seems like Sunday has had like... He's had some very good games, but his he's Poppy had games some games been, that were very underwhelming. His Poppy games have been very good. He's still a big fantasy point player. Like, he still gets quite a bit. But, yes, he has. he's also, like, died 1v1 a lot in very weird and sort of cocky ways. So he he hasn't having the same season that he had last summer, that's for sure. I mean, he's you can bad. also say, if you just look at the champions he's played, he's also they're also not making it like someday has to carry 1v9 and he's going to be the super hard carry again. Because no, he no, has no, been no. put onto Lulu, Nautilus, Ramos. So he has been willing to play those champions. Yeah, it's a lot it's of not like he just, too. It's, not, it's not like he's Cabochard and he just spams all the hard carry champions, you know. Well, yeah, to be fair, though, 11 of his games are on Fjord and Gangplank. <laughs> so... He's had plenty of opportunities to carry, and his win rates are also highest on those champions. So perhaps they might think about, uh, you know, playing more of those style of picks, but instead of the tanks, because it's been just statistically more su successful for them. What do you think of Gangplank as a top lane pick at the moment? Is it still really strong? Well, even after the nerfs in 6 4, we still see it occasionally. Obviously, it's not like a 100% pick ban as it was. It can be strong. Obviously, you're, you're going to have a weaker late game with the number of barrels you can put down right now. Uh, and it's slower to scale because you do get less extra gold. So it's still viable, but it's nowhere near the same power as it as it was previously. It's still strong, though. Because, I mean, when I watch them play, it does seem like it's one of those scenarios where people will think because it was kind of broken before, like when people win on it, oh, it's just because the champion's broken. But when I watch it play, it's, I think it's more like you have to be a very good player to like access it. It's basically what it should be. Champions like that, you should have to be very good to, to get to the point where you can be very successful with it. Unless you're a really good laner with that champion at the moment, it feels like you're, you're not going to do that much, actually. Yeah, well, it's really it's still really good in melee matchups because it's hard to punish Gangplank when he can trade with you with his auto attacks. So there, there still are a lot of opportunities, I feel, to play GP effectively. Range matchups, though, got harder for sure. Okay, and so let me see. Let me see. Right. So SK Telecom, now we will see how good they actually are. Because what, here's the thing. When they beat Jyn Air, I'd love to say, oh, yeah, well, actually, we turned out SKT was better at IEM and they have improved in the comeback. You know what? They beat Jyn Air, who was looking really good. It looked like Jyn Air did a lot of the beating of themselves in that game. It didn't look like SKT was like, amazing. Especially game number two. Uh, SKT did. I mean, Faker had some great engages with Azir in game number two. But uh, And as far from a fantasy perspective, Faker and Bang are, besides Kramer, the other two of the top three players for fantasy. So it's weird that we see SKT getting all the fantasy points this season. Even Blank has been doing super well for fantasy points. So SKT, whereas last year, last summer, remember, I used to say, don't take SKT players, don't take SKT players, don't do it. They win, but they win too cleanly. It's been a lot more kills this this year uh, overall. So that's why we uh, – and especially especially like coming into this week. Uh, SK Telecom already with a victory over Jyn Air. Now, will they beat Rocks? That's going to be the question. Um, I don't know. I think it's definitely possible, given what we saw from Rocks versus Samsung, given what we saw from SKT versus Jyn Air. Could be a great three-game series. Faker, Do you goes find... Uh, what did you actually think of Faker's as I mean, it's always been one of the champions we've criticized him for. Better. It was much better this time. Okay. It was only one game, but he looked good. Uh, what do you do? You actually buy the notion that, like, we saw something improved at IM that that isn't just because they were playing Western teams mainly. No, I think we did see a lot of improvement, particularly from Blank. I mean, Blank was literally nothing like he didn't do anything in any of the four games that he played previously and now he's back from iem and he's doing much more and he's actually a contributing member of the team so that's pretty huge do you think they are gonna like, this is like a commitment like they're gonna keep working him in or will we just see like i mean it is rock types will we just see bangy for the rock series do you think no no they'll play blank 100 percent. okay does that change the matchup then i think can he withstand makes, peanut i i think it certainly makes it better for them Obviously, the big thing about Peanut is it's funny that everyone was talking about the whole thing of like what would happen if we went to like a more tanky jungle meta. I mean, 
he didn't look as good, it has to be said, when he's playing like a Gragas or something like that, but as when he could just invade and beat the shell people on Nidalee or something like that. I also think the Rocks Tigers had some pretty big compositional issues in that game and, or in those two games that they lost. So I'd like to see something more from them for sure and some better drafting because they were they were picking a bunch of stuff that they don't normally pick. I don't know what they were doing. It was very odd. So do you think this will be a three-game series? I think it will be a three-game series, yes. So is it worth, do you think, just gambling and going for the SKT players then? Because the problem, obviously, with the other players is, aside from well, Prey, the, the, everyone's the, the most Tigers. expensive. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. So for expensive, yeah. Certainly Kuro, Kuro and Peanut get a lot of fantasy points. Peanut's the number one jungler. So if it goes to three games, it might be worth picking on both sides of this. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it it could be it could be a it could be a close Okay, right. We'll move to uh, NALCS, though. So, over in the NALCS, we have, I think, quite a, a turn of events overall, because we had... Immortals could have lost another game, Monty. Could have. Keyword could have. They were playing Dignitas, so... Could, could doesn't often mean should. So, what do you think about this? How, is there any weakness in Immortals that you spotted further to anything in the past? Um, hmm. I think like that, how like how how do you get behind on Dignitas like that? Basically, <laughs> I don't I don't think you do really. I mean, uh, the I think you just keep going with Immortals here for all intents and purposes. Okay, because they are obviously playing against, let's see, TSM in the first game, who have looked pretty shaky recently, it has to be said. Yeah, I think you I think you have to take Immortals there. Absolutely. And from a fantasy perspective, it's it's Wild Turtle and Poe Belter are still way up there when it comes to fantasy points, and they have these consistent victories. I don't think TSM is going to be winning that game. And then the other game is tip. So this should be a strong 2-0 yep. for Immortals. Should be. Take Wild Turtle, take Poe Belter for sure. Okay. I mean, just because I can't remember if we'll, if we'll get to this on someone inside. How did you like my uh, my tweet, Monty? Which I won't say if it was a joke or a real comment, but I just said that Poe Belter is one of the most consistent League of Legends players of all time. If he's on a really bad team, he's a mid-tier LCS at mid. If he's on a really good team, he's a mid-tier LCS mid. I, I think, think that he's a good, like, low economy mid player. Like, he doesn't require a lot of attention or a lot of ganks in order to perform at a pretty good level. So I think if that's what your team needs, if you have an emphasis on your side lanes instead, as CLG did, and I would argue as Immortals does right now, then he is actually really, he works really well, right? Because he doesn't, he doesn't require a lot of resources or a lot of attention in order to have a, a solid performance. Because to me, he's one of those players where essentially he's the anti-circle jerk player. Where what happens is a player like him who doesn't go crazy, people will always go, oh, everyone underrates that guy so much. I think he's really good. And then they go the other way and overrate the guy. It's like, oh, come on, man. I thought you were trying to set the record straight. You've just gone the other way now. There's a reason why everyone underrates the guy because he's not super duper good. He's just okay. So chill out. If anything, think about the other way around, guys. If he's winning every fucking game and not looking super good, odds are he's not amazing, is he? Just saying. So, anyway, that was the just saying segment gonna of the show. With you. That was the just saying segment of the show. So, the problem is, outside of Immortals, the teams after them aren't looking quite as strong. Like, on the one hand, Cloud9's still pretty good. 
but they play Echo Fox. Argue, yeah, Cloud Nine is a pretty soft week too. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the the two games they have this week to me is like if Cloud Nine really does have some of the best shot calling, these are the dream matchups. Like these are the ones where you should have lots of opportunities to use that shot calling to win the game. Yes. Echo Fox is, has been is much more real up and down, and Liquid's been a shit show. Yeah, they're great for fantasy. Don't get me wrong, but yes, they are. They do have a lot of issues. Obviously, Liquid, in any match you think Liquid could win, which like the Dignitas one, you want to pick Liquid players. Like Liquid players should be incredibly high value. And I'm looking right now, they're not even expensive. Like Piglet is fifth in terms of, of carries. And Piglet, Shouldn't Cloud9 Liquid the, the be a really great game? Piglet, Dardock, and Phoenix gets crazy amounts of fantasy points. All of them average over 30 points in a win. I mean, in theory, shouldn't that be a great match then for fantasy? Because Cloud9 Liquid, that should be like fights everywhere. No, no, no. Uh, it should be, the crazy match should be Dignitas Liquid. Okay. I, th I just think that's going to be a total shit show. Cloud9 so take Liquid players this week, basically. I would say Liquid players against Dig are really good. And if I'm looking right now, they're actually quite inexpensive. Okay. The other team you may want to take this week, Thorin, is Renegades. Yeah. Why would I do that? Aside from the fact that they haven't improved, they just changed nearly all the team. So, <laughs> however, that's legal. But okay, just, just do that. Yeah. See, this is this is where Monty, like, I, I actually might, you know, in general, I've left you to your own devices to run Renegades. I mean, mainly because I don't ever want to be in sort of like a Rico act type situation where I'm getting fucked over by someone. But anyway, I've left you to your own devices. But I actually think that in the future, I might actually help you out. Okay, what I'll do is you don't have a reality show, so I'm going to make a reality show for you just to fuck with people and show how stupid reality shows are. So what's going to do is, Monty, we'll have a whole episode where we don't explain that like new players join the team and like three new people are in the team. What we'll just do instead is when Renegades wins a couple of games, we're just like, first of all, we'll have like a fake psychologist guy there and it'll be literally me just dressed up like in like a Sigmund <laughs> Freud thing. Like, well, you see the problem with the bot lane is it is underneath the other one but they are not looking on top of the game like we'll do some shit like that right and anyway here's the key part okay what we'll do is I'll, I'll we'll pretend that psychologist is why the team turned around and we won't even mention that they like brought three new players in and then we'll just do that thing where we'll show all the losses and like it'll be all like in black and white like oh and freeze like oh, what's going on and then finally when you beat like a couple of easy games like this week obviously they're playing against tip which echo, is like a very good chip at echo fox so when they finally beat Tip and Echo Fox, we won't even mention that Tip and Echo Fox are not like TSM and Immortals or whatever. We'll just do it like the same way all these shit reality TV shows, which is like they just go like, oh, we've really bounced back. Like things are really looking up for us. You know, we're not feeling a lot more confident in our game. Like don't mention, basically take all context out of the thing and just make a lame little feel good story. Like, ah, oh, yeah, and we're feeling really good this week. Let's see how we do next week. Like we'll do that sort of thing. But okay, so basically against Tip, like tips the, the obvious one that, i mean you could say they'll probably beat tip because tip's been on a bit of a, a downward trend over the last few weeks yes and so is echo fox actually i mean echo fox hasn't been looking that good the only game they've won in the last two weeks has been that giant shit show over dignitas uh so i don't know i think that if you think renegades are going to win freeze does happen to be the the biggest point player in the entire league in terms of points well ahead at over 36. So you could get some, uh, some very good value uh, out of Renegades, I think, this week. If you think Echo Fox is going to do well this week, well, then uh, Froggen's been doing very well, obviously, with his huge like CS totals, getting a lot of fantasy points, too. So there are a couple of different options. You can go right there. Okay. So aside from, here's the question. Okay, so Immortals versus TSM, that one's fairly obvious to predict. But here's a really hard one to predict, which is that TSM plays NRG. And NRG themselves, I mean, it, it hasn't been good for them the last few weeks. So who actually, actually wins this match? Up. They had a very dominant game against Liquid last week. So at least I suppose they have that going for them. Uh, I don't really know. But I, I do think on the prediction end that it could be a little bit hard considering the inconsistency of both of these teams. I'm going to give it to Energy just because of the current state of TSM. I don't, I really they don't get many fancy points, right? Energy? 
Alltech yeah. does. Alltech does and GBM does. Uh, Alltech is probably the best value pick that you have right there. TSM's fantasy points have been shit this season, by the way. Double lift is is pretty high up there, but even then he's behind like five or six other AD carries in NA. So, and no other member of TSM is at the upper echelons of fantasy points. So picking TSM is kind of useless. Don't you find it shocking how underwhelming Yellow Star is in these games for TSM? Yeah, he's been really bad. I mean, I was thinking this the other day. This isn't even an exaggeration. The best support that TSM's ever had is still special. And yet, think of this. They had Lost Boy at one point in time, one of the best sports in the world. They had Yellow Star. I don't know. Even Lost last Boy, season, considering incredibly Lost Boy, high level. Lost Boy, like, last, or like summer 2014 and spring 2015 was doing pretty well. It was pretty good. It's pretty good. It's, but it was, it's, it's at least well. debatable. So it's like, be careful what you wish for. We had even greater players and they were actually underwhelming. It's the TSM curse, see? Like that St. Vicious curse where he was like, they'll never have a good jungler in CLD. To be fair, that wasn't a real curse. It's not like he did any power there. I think Hotshot GG's own natural ability as a GM took over that point. <laughs> I don't I don't think he took any supernatural powers. That's all I'm saying, guys, basically. If you just look at the way that team ran. So what do you actually what is your main if you had to diagnose in like very simple bullet points? What is the biggest problem for TSM at the moment? Total lack of shot calling and team coordination. It's huge. I don't think I can diagnose it. I mean, that's a very wide ranging scope of a bullet point right there, but they just don't seem to have any kind of presence on the map. They don't even really have great lanes anymore because Yellow Star isn't a very good laner. So they can yeah. get bullied in a 2v2 lane and they have trouble lane swapping properly. So, okay, what is that? Like, you made that joke to double lift. Like, if you'd have, if you'd have lane swapped against Renegades, you would have lost or something along those lines. So, is yeah, every team I, just going to use that against them, you think? I don't know. I don't think it's like that severe. That was just a Twitter joke. But okay. I do, they did lose the lane swap really hard against Renegades. I certainly think it's exploitable considering how they performed in, in that particular situation. But it's also exploitable to just simply 2v2 their, their duo lane and win that way. Liquid did that. I mean, remember Piglet Piglet and Matt just stomped all over Yellow Star and Double Lift and snowballed the game out of that lane advantage. So we've seen them lose both ways. And interestingly enough, remember, every time a team does well, people just like, suddenly everyone's popping up. Yeah, you know, I actually play a little role in shot calling myself actually do a little bit of shot calling there what i always love is when you then take people away from the equation okay and what you do is you see what's left over so you take out link he does his dunzo manifesto he's done so he's gone he has no impact on clg now you take out double lift you take out all these players clg pretty good shot calling double lift and tsm dog shit in terms of knowing what the fuck's going on it's almost like the afro moo guy so it's almost like he knows a little thing or two about shot calling and how to play strategically, right, Auntie? It's pretty good at lane swaps. Yeah, shocking. By the way, I, I mean, I should, I should probably save some of this gold for somebody inside, but the problem is I probably won't remember it half, so I'll just blow it now. One of the things that triggers the fuck out of me, it doesn't really because I enjoy seeing TSM lose, but one of the things if I was to care about TSM's well-being that would trigger me is, do you remember, Monty, on the show where you mentioned that Double lift actually used to not ever talk in scrims, and then in games he would just start shot calling out of nowhere. In CLG, do you remember saying that? Yep. So I noticed that in TSM he does something similar. Like for example, whenever I watch TSM Legends, they always come into the back room, you know, like when they've just finished the game, and if they've ever lost a game. First thing they all do is every single member of the team within the first 30 seconds goes like, oh, we just lost because of this. I mean, it's obvious that we lost because of it. It's like, stop a second. You have no idea why you lost because you were just in that game 40 <laughs> seconds earlier and you had no clue what the fuck you did. So I wouldn't be so quick to assume you know what happened. Maybe just percolate on it a little bit. Maybe just think of it, ruminate. Just talk it over, maybe. Pro players like, listen, do guys, that. We can all, all pro players all do that, though. Don't need to talk about that. Even worse, Monty, it gets worse. One of the people who talks the most it's fucking double lift. And he starts saying stuff like, like he'll start, he'll say stuff not even about bot lane, dude. He'll just be like, see, the problem was when we got invaded earlier at that jungle point, like you just can't let that happen. Like, what? 
Is anyone going to shut this guy up? Like, he's literally a fucking creep killer. That's all he is. That's all he is. And he's like taking over the game. Like, listen, guys, Yellow Star, can you shut the fuck up, mate? I'm trying to talk here. Like, I think what we did wrong in this game was like, I can't handle it. To, it to be fair, all, all pro players do that. It's one actually one of their most annoying traits. Uh, that when you they get out of a game, they're just like, oh, we just lost for this reason. We don't need to review that, you know, Vaughn. We know why we lost. Yeah. I don't think you do, actually. I think that there were many factors that played into the situation that developed. Because they'll just put it at one point, but they won't look at any of the things that got to that point that allowed that thing to happen in the first place. And the rationale is, oh, if we, just, if we just don't let that happen again, and they, have, they don't know how they even let it happen in the first place. Yeah, that's part of the problem as well, is they also think, they make this key error of thinking also that when you identify what went wrong, that's also the solution is contained within identifying. Like, well, now that I know that, I wouldn't do it again, would I? It's like, oh, really? Oh, okay. I, well, I, I thought you had to learn then what to do as the alternative. No, no, no. Well, now that I know that that's wrong, I, just, I would never do that again, you know, so. Oh, well, sorry there, polymath double lift, who is some hyper learner who just like, actually, I, I actually tell, it's like, I remember, okay, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of what double lift is not okay. I once read an interview about, uh, with the coach of SK Telecom in Brood War, when, when or one of the coaches, when uh, Isla Vuvi, the great player, was one of their coaches, okay, he was like an assistant coach. And he actually said that what was so incredible about Bisu was that Bisu actually didn't have to ever, do, like the, one of the star players of the team, he never actually had to do a VOD review because he actually was so insane that as he would play at the end of the game, he could literally tell you like, oh yeah, actually, like, I understand at this point I made a mistake and then four minutes later it meant I was in this situation. And he essentially, this guy was just so like ridiculously intuitive to the game that he could actually sort of vodge review while playing. Now, the reason I bring that up is that because that wasn't bullshit, that is so incredible that anyone could do that and be a very good player. The notion that Doublelift is doing this, I, I don't buy that. In fact, I'm not even sure. Here's the problem with Doublelift, okay? I feel like Doublelift is one of those guys where I could wreck this guy just because if I was his coach, I would explain what happened and you know, I'd be talking to him. And at the end of it, I'd just say, Doublelift, could you actually just repeat the main sort of talking points of what I just said now? And I reckon this guy would go blank. He'd be like, uh, uh, playing as a team and uh, the, the le level ones, uh, level and then the, the team fighting and... It, I was, I, I'll admit, I was thinking about the pizza that we're going to get. Like, I, I, I don't think he, he wouldn't, he would fail. He would not be able to repeat what I just said. I would get him. Unfortunately, that's not actually considered a premier quality in coaching to just be able to catch players out, humiliate them, and then go, you can't be taught, mate, and then just leave. So I wouldn't be, I'm not saying I'd be a good coach, Monty. I'm just saying that it would make for good segments on TSM Legends. If anything, Monty, what I've just said is I would be the ultimate coach for TSM. Because I would be a coach just for the cameras. No one would be able to deny it, but I would be fantastic at that. I would literally be for the cameras. I would make it the most entertaining show possible. And what's great is we'd lose loads of games, but that's just setting my stage up to be even better on TSM Legends. No one wants to see when they win and be like, yeah, great game. It's like you want to see what happens when they lose. I mean, I'd just even, listen, since since it's reality TV, Monty, I'm not, I'm, remember, I'm not being hired to be an actual coach of the team. Since it's reality TV, I'd even come in and just say stuff like, I mean, listen, double lift. I mean, I, you know, we, you're a good player and everything, but listen, listen, I'm not surprised your family didn't want you around. You know, if you can play like that. So. And then just because think of the drama, think of the, think of the drama. He'd be like, what the fuck, man? That's so fucked up. You say, I got fucked up the way you don't listen to me. Why are you just listening to me, man? Why are you buying wars? What, you don't care about your family here? Like, <laughs> dude, I, I would be the ultimate coach for reality TV shows only. Like, I don't know anything about the game. I'm not implying I'd be a good coach in that sense, but I'd be, I'd be fucking gold. I'd, essentially, Monty, I'd be vanilla in the server. I'd be fucking gold in that dressing room on TSM Legends. I'm the best TSM Legends member you will never see. So on, the, on that note... That was a pretty big digression there. We weren't even talking about TSM anymore. So we talked about TSM. What about CLG? Because CLG this week play NRG and Dignitas. So pretty good schedule. CLG, yeah, CLG has been a pretty disappointing team when it comes to points, though, and fantasy points. And they did lose to Liquid last week. So CLG, I think, is kind of getting exposed for their split push only strategy and the weakness of some of their players like Stixay and Huhi on an individual level. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd take their players. I'm really unconvinced. Maybe against Tigatas, that'd be okay. But So does that make it worth 
like like how close do you think it is between CLG and NIG in terms of NIG having a chance to win? Because obviously if we'd rather NIG can win and then we can pick Altec. So what are the chances NIG wins that game, do you think? Uh, I think decent. Like I said, NRG was looking better. CLG has been looking slightly worse. I'd give it a 50-50. Okay. Okay, I have a quick question for you. So since Dignitas plays CLG and Liquid this week, and you've already said like the Liquid game is going to potentially be good, how do Dignitas get these massive leads that they then subsequently throw? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Thorin. It's a, it's a new throw every week, so they find exciting and new ways to throw. I mean, I, one of the things I will say is impressive. We mentioned this many times on past I, episodes. I, I, Thorin, 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 this, this may this may surprise you, but I actually don't spend a lot of time personally an, analyzing why Dignitas throws games. I actually have better right. things to do than take a look at why one of the worst teams in one of the worst regions in the world is losing. No, but here's the thing, Monty. That's where you've, you've made your key mistake there. Because if the universe is holographic, the core principle of a hologram is that every unit of it contains something that reflects the whole. So if you could just figure out, Monty, what, what goes wrong in Dignitas games when they're ahead and they throw, you might figure out everything. You might figure out like your relationship with your dad. You might figure out like why so it's, one it's of your like, children might like, die one day. Everything. Like the theory of everything will come from this. Reducing a fractal to its like exactly. initial component that just spiraled into this yeah. like extremely large image. But if we can what get I'm back saying to is, the first figure of the fractal. In some sense, what goes wrong in Dignitas games is everything that goes wrong in life, in love, in war, in, in economics, in history. If we could just solve the Dignitas problem, we could solve this whole problem. This whole crazy thing called life. That's what I'm saying. Or they might just be this shit team with underwhelming players that find a way to lose a lot. So one thing I will give credit for, though, we've mentioned this on past episodes, is that the best player on Dignitas probably has been Shifter, and he has been getting tons of kills. Yeah. And, I forget and which Apollo, game it was. Apollo he Shifter, actually had a very... Apollo and Shifter, if you think Dig is going to win, if you want to go out on a limb, huge fantasy point players, Apollo and Shifter. So you should definitely get them. They're two out of the top four players for fantasy points. And like as I was saying, like in, in one of those games last week, Shifter did have like a, a fucking ton of kills. Yes, I think it was, the, it, was the, it was the Immortals, it was the Immortals game. Corky. Yes, they yeah. lost it. He was playing Corky. But yeah, he went pretty ham. So not a bad pick. Bearing in mind he's going to play against Team Liquid, that might be doable. Right, Don't think go to EU. Yeah, okay, we'll do EU now. Right, so over in EU, we have. Uh, let's just do the most interesting games first. So, okay, H two K plays Unicorns of Love. What do you think of that game? Uh, I haven't really liked where Unicorns of Love has been in the past few weeks. They started out the season really strong, but in the last several weeks, they've gone what like. Four and I mean, they mainly like one and one all the time, yeah. Yeah, they're one and one or 0 2 pretty much all the time. They went 0 2 this, this past week when they had to play against Origin with Xpeke in it, and they also lost to Elements. So I think Unicorns of Love is, is a little bit on the downswing here. So <laughs> I think I would be much more confident in going with obviously H2K here. I think that's a pretty good lock. I mean, the problem with their one on ones is usually it was they were just beating the bad teams. Like they, they beat the bottom feeders, and the last and really they, good win they had was the Fnatic one. That was like week five. So that was over a month ago. Yeah. So I don't really see them going much further. And I don't see them taking out H2K, especially as H2K is really motivated to get to the top and secure their like a top seed in the playoffs. So who do you think will um, be the best players to take for H2K in that sort of a match? Well, let me tell you. Uh, H2K, actually, because they close out pretty efficiently, is not great for for fantasy. Interestingly, Yankos is actually the highest player, followed by Ryu. Uh, when Selfie was subbing, he was doing very well for fantasy. But H2K is sort of like Cloud9 last year. They're going to win a lot of games, but they're going to do it in such an efficient manner that they're not going to get a lot of fantasy points. So it's probably not even worth going for them, even though they have a very obviously a very good chance to to win this game. And the players are very expensive right now. Okay. So the other side of that coin, though, is 
if unicorns of love win, their late games have not been as smooth. And Steelback is the second highest player after X Pepe in the league for fantasy points. And Fox, Rudy, and Lulex are also all in the top seven. So they go nuts. So any unicorns of love game that you think UOL will win is definitely worth going for. But they have to play H2K and G2 this week. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay. So speaking of G2, they play Unicorns of Love and Splice. So yep. the question is, in a big stop, yeah, G2 is going to be good, right? Perks. Perks is number four for fantasy. He is huge. He may be expensive. He's 8,300 for day one. But I think that he's well worth it. He gets nearly 30 points in a win. So here's my question. Aside from perks, the, the usual option is trick or emperor. So at the moment, based on the teams they're going to play and the type of game it might be, who do you think is better as a second G2 player, trick or emperor? Um, hmm. uh, they're so close for average points that I think it's more important to probably look at matchup in that particular instance. So, so we've got splice and unicorns of love. I guess I would slightly lean towards Trick against those two teams, especially since there's like uh, the Unicorns of Love have been playing Lulex, who legitimately has not been doing poorly, uh, as poorly as he did on H2K last season. But, but at I least think, Unicorns of Love has Steel back, so that's not as terrible in that sense. I guess, I guess, yeah. It's just the jungle to jungle matchup, I think, is a little bit more in favor of, of G2 in the, in those matches. Okay. And Vitality also has a very easy week. They play Rockat and Splice. Now, Rockat has had uh, the odd win recently, not not totally terribly, but how impressed with Vitality are you, I guess, in this sense? Because these should be easy wins on paper. And Rockat went 0 2 last week. Vitality, I think, again, they've got. Like G2, they've got a fairly easy week to try and work their way back up the standings into that number one position after they lost to G2 last week. Vitality is a team, though, that, again, doesn't get a lot of points. Cabochard is their main carry. He's the one who gets most of the points when they play well. But like H2K, they play a much more, I would say, macro game focus. And they are pretty much about good map pressure and using teleport well to get farm advantages. So I wouldn't say that they're the best fantasy team. So probably the best G, game of G2 this two is G2 is definitely like G2 and UOL are definitely like for fantasy, the best overall teams. So the best actual marquee game this week, because there's so many like good team versus bad team one is Fnatic Origin. And those are the two teams who are at IEM. What do you think are, who will actually win this matchup? Well, I don't know. Do you buy the hype on that Fnatic went, improved, improved, improved? Uh, not particularly they they lost to vitality last week and it wasn't a particularly good game also origin went 2-0 now that they have x peke back but they also played unicorns of love and rock out this is going to be the and apparently x peke is on the roster again they have to play giants this week but they're going to be that's going to be i think the first real test i don't know who's going to win this game there's i think there's too many variables right now i wouldn't feel very comfortable calling it fevivin if you want, if you think Fnatic's going to win, Febivin does tend to do very well for Fnatic. Everybody else on either of these teams is kind of not great. Does it blow your mind that people in Europe did not just ban Jin against Reckless? Is it as obvious as that? I mean, I think basically, I think yeah, just one on Jin, most on everything else, almost. Yeah, I, I, I think you should just ban Jin against them. I hope. I hope we do see Origin do that. For Origin, though, Sven is definitely the carry. I think they're for Fnatic, it's Fevvin who gets the points and, and Sven who gets the points for, for Origin. And there's not much else from a fantasy perspective outside of that. What do you think it was about that pick that Reckless was particularly good on? What do you think it suited his style books? Obviously, not many people had tried it aside from like Sneaky, I think. So what, what was he making work on, Jim? Well, Prey has tried it now, too, with the Tigers, and he did pretty well on it. Um he also lost on it to Samsung. But anyway, uh, I think that Reckless can play pretty far back with Jin and play a very safe style of AD carry and still output a lot of damage. He also could just clean up the team fights. Like he's not afraid to enter the team fights at the back half and start to, because Jin it rewards players who are going to use his ultimate when people are low or use his abilities because he does 
damage based on percent of missing HP a lot of the time. So yep. you really want to clean up fights with him. He's like the ultimate janitor champion. And okay, so I'm seeing I'm seeing the connection here. So the ultimate janitor champion for the ultimate cleanup player. There we go. AD clean up ADC baby. We got that champion necessary. Okay. So what do you get the man who plays uh Kenan ADC? Get him a cleanup ADK. There we go. So that's the end of the show for this week. Again, enter the code BTN for a 100% pending bonus up to $300. I mean, for me to even have to wait to get three hundred dollars seems egregious. You know, I get three hundred dollars all the time, anytime I want, like ching ching, every few seconds. And the, the amount of money is incredible. So that's pretty. Any? Do you have any parting words? Just it's, you, pick out. Just say like, p say three random words, and then we'll see if in some sort of Burroughs cut up technique, Joycey and manner, it has some relevance to next week. Just say three random words. Uh, cowboy. Document yeah. confidential. There you go. Okay. Well, let's see if there was a secret plan for Renegades next week. If it is, be sure to do it by the numbers.